And now, Noah shall convene the newest episode of The Discussion. Welcome everyone to the discussion. It only took us 40 minutes to get where we are right now. Um, Yay, and we have two camera angles. Um, we watched uh, our first international film this episode because doing the AFI Top 100 has been an absolute delight, but we also realized it's extraordinarily limiting because it doesn't allow us to watch some of the greatest films that were ever made overseas. And on that note, Noah, what did we watch today? Mm -hmm. Today we watched Ran by the director Akira Kurosawa, um, who is a fantastic Japanese director and was a great introduction into Eastern films because he's so sort of intertwined with a lot of uh, Western films. Really fascinating film. Also one of the later ones that he did in his career, uh, which was primarily from 1960 to 1975, and this one takes 10 places after, 10 years after that. I thought this was his last film. Uh, third to last. Third he to last. made an announcement that this was supposed to be his last film and then did one in 1990 and his very last one was in 1993. So I chose this movie for us to watch because yeah. uh, Kurosawa as a director is someone who was not only incredibly influenced by what was going on in America and Hollywood at the time, but he also in return basically inspired every American director after him mm -hmm. in a lot of interesting ways. So he's kind of this really interesting melting pot of evolution for cinema as a whole and I had not seen this movie movie before. I'd only seen bits and pieces, uh, but I had been told it has some of the best uh, sieges ever put to film. It has some of the most impactful uses of color and just like yes. insane imagery. Uh, and it lived up to all of those for me while not being my favorite Kurosawa I've seen and maybe in my top 100 movies. That's like where I'll put it. I think I respected this movie on a visual level, on a sound design level, acting level, um, so much of that. But for me, the structure and pacing, I struggled with a little bit. And I think, and I we really briefly talked about this before uh, coming in here, which is that one of the interesting struggles with doing this movie is that it is different culturally. It comes from a, a totally different history in a totally different place. And so some of the things that had to be taken into account when watching it were the fact that um, we are not Japanese. And so there are some things that I felt that we might be missing out on um, just from a, a cultural yeah. lens. In that note, I even heard there's a couple characters who are using a specific type of acting approach yeah. for their characters that is tied to Japanese plays, like J Japanese. Kabuki and stuff, yeah. And so for us, like, I feel like that was a lot of it lost. Like, the relevance, the importance, the reflection to real world historical figures. Like, I'm American educated. I don't know any of that. Could you set up the actual character, who it is, and like what their role is in the movie? Sure, yeah. So the, it's a really the, interesting character. I guess the main character that we follow is the, the he's not an emperor, he's, he's a warlord, mm -hmm. um, uh, powerful and or, old lore, warlord boy. Powerful, <laughs> That's a tongue twister. powerful and old warlord. Yeah, say that five times fast. Um, who is at the end of his reign and is ceding his power to his three sons and separating his um, empire. And so his name is, oh God, Hidetora? I think, yeah. I think I you think nailed so. it. I think that's spot on. I was actually like Almost, afraid to say it that's first. That's his first name. I can't remember the, the name of the fa the family name. Uh, it's I-C-H something and just my American tongue can't say yeah, it. I think I, it's like Ichi... Ichi... Mo, I don't yeah. know. I'm not sure. I'm going to butcher it, and I would. I just don't want to. Uh, the best comparison is to King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear. Um, he's at the end of his life, and he's sort of being driven mad by um, the separation of his family, sort of the, the um, separation of family ties. Mm -hmm. um, and his acting, I think, is most, like even his facial, facial expressions, the makeup that they put on him is all sort of, I feel really hyper um, emotional. I found him to be the most Shakespearean. Yeah. Yeah, I found it to be an extremely Shakespearean character portrayal and like costuming design, makeups, everything. It all fell in line with that for me. Insofar as it definitely did feel more like, um, like the set pieces very, felt very cinema cinematographic. I think that's the right term. I guess, but cinematography act good. <laughs> acting plays. <laughs> His acting felt like it, all the actors felt like they were coming out of a theater, but all of the um, direction and shooting felt like it was being done by someone who 
does movies, who shoots movies. Does well, that make sense? That's kind of the most interesting angle to talk about this movie from. It's a blending of a lot of styles and it doesn't clash at all. Because we were talking about like there's yeah. these different approaches to even just the acting, but I also found the cinematography to be very Kurosawa. Gorgeous. Um, but and the usage of color is so over the top, but it all makes sense in world. It's all justified in the story. And yeah. so it's almost like he just earned having this bombastic style to tell this Shakespearean tale in a way that it just resonates on a visual level so powerfully. Yeah. Um, and the initiating incident I love for this movie um, where you have the father deciding, like after realizing how tired and old he is, he wants to uh, give his kingdom to his oldest son or they, this oldest son would be in the biggest, best castle mm-hmm. um, and his second oldest son would be in the second best and his third oldest son would be in the third and then they would control uh, his territories with his oldest son having the most authority. And... I, it's funny at the beginning of the movie there's like the one kid who's like the bad son who's like this is a horrible idea like you're making a stupid decision and the movie sets up really well for you to be like that guy's a bad person but then at the end of the movie you're like he was absolutely right yeah <laughs> everything he said came to be and he was set up to be the villain but in reality he's the voice of wisdom of like don't fucking do this it's a really bad idea and what I love about that is there's even another uh, character who speaks up in this moment and yeah. goes your son is speaking harshly because the way the youngest son is speaking is like straight up kind of disrespectful respectful he's like you're an old senile fool but one of the like prized advisors says like listen to him he's just speaking from the heart and that's when the viewer gets clued in on like maybe this is actually the right answer and we even see like this youngest son then has like he gets banished him and the advisor who stood up for them they have to go on the run but then there's a really big turn in the narrative where it's largely the manipulation of the wife of one of the sons yes. that results in a lot of this ruination because she is a forced bride from mm-hmm. a family they conquered. And so she is like trying to slowly, subtly pull the strings to make this family completely fall apart. And while the youngest son didn't obviously foresee that, he did foresee dividing power especially unequally, is going to result in conflict. And he was right, because all this uh, wife needed to then do mm. was just start pushing, just little pushes. Yeah. And that's and this massive domino effect resulting in the death of thousands. That was brilliant. That was, uh, first of all, well, well said, but yeah, that was a brilliant foil, having that sort of extra piece inserted in there. Uh, the wife's name is Kata. And I'm, I might be pronouncing that wrong, but it's K-E, K-A-E-D-E. Um, but getting into the uh, the conflicts again. So it, it's very played out at this point, but I imagine for this point in cinema, it, it maybe not quite as much. But we see a scene where the father is deciding to abjugate power and he gives each of his sons one arrow. They break it easily. Then he gives them three. And he says, look, together, you can't break all three. As long as you three stay united, our kingdom will be strong. But the youngest son is like, that's just a fucking metaphor. <laughs> like he's like, it's not reality. And you're actually speaking to the truth of it. Whereas the more you divide power, the more room there is for other people to wiggle in and start doing these things. And it's really interesting to see something that should be put forth like a fairy tale that everyone goes, yes, as long as we stay united, great. Because like in a Disney movie, that would actually right, be the for answer. Sure. But here it's like, that's stupid. <laughs> like, that's yeah. really dumb. Life's not that simple. And I really love seeing that displayed that way. Um, and then that ties into the usage of color throughout the movie for me where they oh my god the color sets dividing lines always between different characters how like their men are positioning so there's like a literal dividing line of armies but also it's showing you like it'll be used to show power and position it's fantastic let me sorry go ahead keep going no i was gonna finally say that like and i think if you watch the opening of the movie as well there's the way the brothers are divided in their colors there's the tint around them that's like the actual like father's royal gold or whatever black and gold yeah consuming them there's a lot that was done directorially and through costuming design which i want to give equal shout out for the costuming of this movie magnificent that you can just continue to read more and more into the themes we've already talked about that were set up visually represented uh, especially during the siege but i don't know if we're ready to talk about the siege yet because that is the sieges were gorgeous they were really beautiful and that's i just wanted to take a brief pause just to talk about the costume design because this is um the only film that and i'm I'm shamelessly going from my phone. Uh, so Kurosawa received his only career nomination for Best Director for this film. Uh, That's a the, crime. I know. <laughs> tell me about it. But Rand did win an Academy Award for costume design. So the costume designer, um, Emmy Wada, or Weda, won the Academy Award for it. There were 1,400 
handmade costumes for this film, which took about three years to make. And Kurosawa, knowing this fact and knowing how beautiful the costumes were, went out of like went above and beyond from a directorial standpoint to make sure that when they're like for the siege scenes or for pretty much any scene to have it be kind of a dull background so that the color would pop more because the really? costumes were so beautiful. It's an excellent decision. And I almost, there were a couple scenes where I thought he had shifted to a monochrome, um, yeah. like a, to a black and white reel and had somehow, and had like somehow colorized specific uh, flags or like elements of armor or something. Um, and no, it's just, it's just a really like gray monochromatic background with really bright beautiful popping colors it's it's it i don't mean to talk about the last movie we reviewed it reminded me of schindler's list when you see the girl with just sure. the red jacket yeah. but it's it's a usage where it's actually in lens it's not a post oh we only yeah. recorded no no no. this is actually how it was recorded that's yeah. amazing to Incredible. me and i just want to clarify so kurosawa never got a best director oscar nope. This is the only already, one that he was nominated for. I already hated the Oscars for a thousand different reasons, but like, dude. <laughs> which also just kind of, you know, and not that, which a little bit calls into question sort of the AFI too. Well, um, they're the American film institute. This is Japanese. No, no, no. I understand that. I just mean insofar as it's really hard to be, um, to be objective about these kind of things. It's really hard to pick and choose. Um, Directors like who who are the like auteurs and who deserves to be on the list and who are like the great popcorn filmmakers who have just as much quality but in different areas. Um, I actually that's actually so I don't view popcorn director as an insult in any way, shape, or form. No. And to me, I think one of the beauties of this film and Kurosawa's entire back catalog is he has this almost popcorn appeal with how visually entertaining as films are like a lot of the more auteur directors the top sure. of that they have a much more reserved held back i don't feel like he's held back ever yeah. like it's so to the camera a lot of the time and he does like to make these choices that are so striking it almost does feel like it's more of like a tarantino moment like there's this spray of blood yes. i know a sec as soon as i said that that was going to come to I your i was head. wondering if we were going to talk about that what yeah because there's this one i think it's a straight up decap decapitation yes. I'm not, yeah where blood just goes wild on the wall on a, basically a blank cam canvas yeah. right like a gray wall can it's incredible and yeah. it, to me like that's not something that i expected the movie to do but yeah. suddenly it was just like like Tarantino gore. <laughs> that doesn't happen even in like the bloodiest moments of the siege. You see blood, but it's not over the top. It's yeah. very uh, horrific. But then every now and then there's just that moment where you're like, okay. oh shit. <laughs> yeah. That was cartoonish, but in a very effective way. And I guess uh, we don't technically see the decapitation, but it would be really hard to. Um infer or imply that it was anything else other than with the amount of blood that sprayed against the wall. Um, but yeah, How would like, you know that? Is that from experience? You know about the different blood spray levels? From if I told you, I'd have to decapitate you. <laughs> Kurosawa learned a lot by trial and error because he had done a number of films um, prior to this. Uh, Seven Samurai is one of his big ones. Rashomon. Um, I think Seven Samurai is most well known. Probably. That's the only one that I have seen of his films before this. Um, and Which arguably is the most influential film for modern cinema. Yeah. I don't think that's crazy to say. Do you want to talk about uh, Ants, Snake, uh, A Bug's Life, the Disney Pixar film basically being <laughs> Seven Samurai? I mean, that's no, what it is. Like, not that's, now. That's, um, another, that's another video for another day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But just to say that the, the reach of Kurosawa is incredibly broad. Um, so you do have children's movies that are made by Pixar that are essentially just uh, their own take of um, Kurosawa's Seven Samurai. Obviously, it goes off in a, on a different tangent once they hire the circus performers. But up until that point, basically the same plot. Um, you tell me there are circus performers in Seven Samurai? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling you that the Seven Samurai basically revolves around um, a giant caterpillar who turns into a beautiful butterfly. For those of you who haven't seen, that's exactly what the movie is. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, Kurosawa learned some really valuable things from shooting his previous film. So when he shoots the siege for, for the movie that we're talking about, which is Ran, uh, he has actually a lot of stationary cameras set up just at various points in the, um, at various like locations for the siege and just lets the sort of the choreography unfold. So you're not, uh, you're not following like a shaky camera moving and sort of being 
tumbled amidst the chaos. It's actually kind of, it's a nice juxtaposition yeah. knowing that the film is called Chaos and that it follows a chaotic storyline. Um, and so to have the siege be actually so beautifully structured and like just having still shots of, um, you know, a lot of movement was kind of a really nice thing for him to do. I thought that was really clever and yeah, it worked and, really well. And you see it reflected again in the Saving Private Ryan scene where you're like back up in the pillboxes just watching soldiers on the beach pour out. Like that's, it's the same approach where it's like you're just watching people pour into the castle. You're watching the soldiers pour onto the beach. Like it's a very similar, do you disagree? No, I, um, I have a really bad habit of putting ice cubes in my mouth and I don't want to chew the ice cube while uh, there's a mic attached to me. No, Joe, chew. He can, he can mute the audio. That's fine. <laughs> Um, so, okay, we need to set up uh, what exactly is happening at this siege. So, obviously, the plan to just equally distribute the power among his sons didn't go well. <laughs> and now, uh, here, wh how, why exactly is this castle being attacked? I don't know. Okay, well, so the three sons' names are Saburo, Jiro, and Toro. Tero? Yeah. Tero is Tero. the oldest. Uh, Tero is the one who is supposed to just be in charge. And the father has kind of been burdening the sons a little bit because he's just going around with this small army his, of guards. His remaining army of guards and uh, demanding hospitality from his sons. And Keita, the wife, uh, basically imposes herself, imposes her will uh, onto her husband and says, well, you know, you really shouldn't let your father be doing that and sort of, uh, you know, watching over you. You, should, you need to, like, take control of your castle and banish him. Um, and then he goes to his second son's castle and the second son has already been plotting to attack like within minutes he's been plotting to attack his older brother it's a little awkward it's like oh hey dad <laughs> whoops <laughs> um but i don't i'm i am having i am actually struggling to like figure out what happened in the middle there where the siege takes place so I'm sorry the sons are showing up and the father essentially has come to the first city to just stay there and have some form are you looking up what happens kind of. that's, that's, yeah. i'm also struck <laughs> no it's hard i mean this is um it's one, one of the great things about foreign films is that you get to experience new directors and new stories that you haven't seen told a thousand times before one of the difficult things about it is that they can be really complicated and it's ha sometimes hard to follow along with the plot and the characters when the names and language do not resonate i just remember it's clearly the um wife of the oldest brother's manipulation that makes this happen mm -hmm. and then the oldest brother during the siege dies yes and what happens from there is essentially a master class of manipulation from his widow because she has no loyalty to this family. In fact, it's her whole goal to just make sure this family falls apart and crumbles because they killed her family and took over their lands. Mm -hmm. So she, after her husband, who is the oldest brother, dies, then successfully seduces the second oldest brother by putting a knife to his throat. Who wouldn't fall in love with that? <laughs> and uh, then sleeping with him. And then after they sleep together, she essentially says, like, our lovemaking was so great. We are so perfect together. I can't stand the idea of another woman who's ever had you living. So kill your wife. And this guy goes, sure, golly, good gosh, why don't I do that? Um, and he tries to order one of his, like, top guys to go and kill his wife. And his top guy is like, no, <laughs> not gonna go kill your wife, you fucking weirdo. <laughs> and so when he's finally basically put in a position where he's like, you gotta do this, he comes back with a fox head statue in a box of salt because the wife of the oldest brother who died is like, I want her head in a box of salt. So he brings back a fox head statue and she's like, you're playing a joke at us. He's like, nah, man, foxes take the uh, appearance of women all the time. Actually, <laughs> I killed her and it looks like she she turned back into a fox in the salt. It's fucking wild. <laughs> so then the Saburo wins mm -hmm. of the brothers. Yes. Kind of. By basically being inactive. Actually, he's the only one who makes an intelligent decision. One of the warlords from the beginning of the movie approaches him shortly after he's banished by his father and says, actually, I know what you said was really disrespectful, but to me it displayed a whole lot of character that you were willing to speak your mind. And even though you're banished now, I actually, I think that that personality trait is really valuable. So even though you have no more lands, 
um, I would like you to marry my daughter. Yeah. And that's like the most intelligent decision that he makes because guess who ends up with basically, a, you know, essentially a royal family and a wife and a castle and guards. Yeah. But then he dies. <laughs> yeah. But how does he die? Uh, so they the battles are essentially done. They found the warlord father who's able. So the warlord father has been going insane. He has lost his mind and he's just being tormented and he's finally able to recover enough of his sanity after Saburo finds him and he's on the back of the horse. And uh, some soldiers that were sent from the second oldest brother, I think Juro? Yeah. Uh, they actually were sent to assassinate this brother yeah. and they shoot him while he's on horseback. And the father is literally telling him like, I cannot believe how much I have to apologize to you. Some tales I need to tell you. Essentially saying like, he's apologizing to his youngest son for being wrong. I mean like, you're absolutely right. This was the wrong choice to make. And the son is like, that's great father. We're gonna be wonderful. Don't worry about it. Boom, he gets shot and dies. And then the warlord father in his grief dies on top of his son and the movie, the last thing we get is this basically these decimated armies just carrying the dead bodies of their rulers and it fades to black movie. Yep. Done. And it was really like I didn't enjoy it a ton, but it's like a master class in filmmaking. Yeah. It's every scene is just like extraordinarily presented and you'll be on like jaw on the floor. Yeah, it is, it is a definitely a beautiful film to watch uh, just color wise and the way that it's directed and shot. Um, it's also, I will say, genuinely interesting to see a different kind of acting than mm -hmm. we're used to. It's nice to see something different than method acting. It's nice to see something different than just a, Americanized sort of Hollywood acting or, you know, British acting. Um, that was really fascinating. I do, I do kind of stand by the thing that we brought up earlier, which is um, I think when we watch a lot of American films, we have so much context already in place just from fairy tales and children's tales and cartoons and books that we might have read and just sort of our general culture, the way we interact with one another, that when we see those films, they resonate more with us. Easier. Um, They're easier. going yeah. off a foundation we just inherently understand. Exactly. And so I think I would be really curious to know what um, a Japanese director or even just, you know, the, a Japanese person uh, who grew up with Japanese stories and like Eastern culture and you know and all of those sort of like folk tales and just the way that they interact with one another. And they're much more familiar with the real history this is loosely yeah. based off of. Yeah, exactly. I would be so this doesn't really uh, maybe it's in my top 100 like you know in the high 90s or something. Um, but I'm really glad to have watched it. If we're going off of like not my enjoyment, but just like the spectacle of the film, this mm -hmm. is super high up there for me. Cause like yeah. there are so many shows, especially how much of this, like you have to understand, this is the most expensive Japanese film ever at this mm -hmm. point. And everything you're watching is practical, obviously, because they're not doing anything CG in the 80s. Yep. So you're actually watching like flaming arrows shoot by actors at yeah. certain points. There's these amazing sets that are, I would love to see a breakdown of how they did that siege, just beat by beat from the set design to the what they told oh, the choreography. Incredible. Oh, unbelievable! Like absolutely bar setting for the time, and holds up at the best of the best today. Um, there, there are some massive movies that are influenced by Kurosawa. So we've already mentioned um, my favorite ants, Snake, where we found a bug's life. Uh, also, quick shout out to Emily. Emily's favorite movie. She can quote almost that entire movie. Uh, ants solo. Yeah, not a bug's life. A bug's life. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> This whole time you made a bug's life. I did mean it. Yeah. Can, hey, Ben, can you, like, every time I say the word ants, can you just uh, take this audio, a bug's life, and just put it directly over my mouth? I don't know how you would do that. I'm really sorry. Don't do that. Don't but keep just this part in. Let me. Okay. A bug's life, a fistful of dollars, some of Clint Eastwood's earliest and best work. Um, Tarantino, as we've mentioned, Spielberg with Saving Private Ryan, and those are four massive films and massive directors. Uh, and that's on the short list. Oh, how about Star Wars A New Hope? That's yeah, that's, <laughs> I was like, I was wondering when you're gonna bring up George Lucas, because George Lucas, he's the only one who goes so far as, I don't know if it's influence and if it's just stealing. Or if it's just copying. Because yeah, George Lucas straight up just took so much of Kurosawa's like staples and most iconic characters and scenes. It was just like, mine. <laughs> I mean, all of <laughs> but the- But space. <laughs> the Stormtroopers and Darth Vader, all of those costume designs are as far as I'm aware, largely based on sort of samurai uh, yeah. style and attire. Oh, and the characters of C-3PO and R2-D2 are just R lifted. Yeah. Uh, but I think that takes us to our uh, final questions. Would you want to see this remade today? Yeah, really? I would. Okay. I would like to see this remade. Um, I would be really, because, and I, 
I think one of the most interesting things about Ran is that it's not only a, a take on King Lear, but I think that we see a lot of Kurosawa himself in uh, Hidetori, or mm -hmm. the, you know, the main guy. I think there's a lot of sort of personal projecting of Kurosawa as a person, someone who is a dominant Japanese filmmaker and then who sort of fell from grace, um, not by any like, you know, not by anything that he did, but just sort of by the way that the the, the Japanese film industry went after post seventies. Um, I think that there's a lot of himself in the main character, and I would be really curious to see what a new director, um, Japanese director, could do, how they could make it their own, um, and also just kind of curious to see what we could do with uh, like modernized technology. I'm not talking CGI, I just you know for stability of shots and for colorization and you know scope of things. Yeah, I would love to see it remade. I am going to disagree purely because I feel like this has been done many more times because it is King Lear mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, at least from what people have told me. I don't remember King Lear that well. And I just think, uh, it, like, I can't imagine it being done better. It's one of those things where I'm like, I can't s think of this being done in a way where, like, it, after watching Jaws, Jaws would not be done better now. Right. Ran would not be done better now in the same vein. Um, so, and I also think it is a very distinctly Kurosawa film in its presentation, and that's largely what makes it work. And I can't think personally of a director, Japanese or otherwise, who could hit that style that allowed this telling of this classic story with all these twists to be that effective. And if you're not doing exactly that, are you really remaking Ran? Right. So that's why I would say no. Um, and that being said, is it in my top 100 personally? Yes. But it's very low, like you said, yeah. or if we're going like, yeah, just in my terms of like how well it's made, obviously it's in the top 100, but in my own enjoyment, not necessarily. And I think insofar as we're going to be going sort of back and forth occasionally and doing movies from the AFI and then doing foreign films, um, it'll be interesting to see that number, say for um, Ran, it'll be interesting to see that number sort of move up and down as we watch more foreign films by yeah. other directors and say, wow, this is really truly is a spectacle, not just as a Japanese film, not just as like, but as a film in general, when you compare it against all the other films that are out there from different um, countries and continents. I think that'll sort of like have a, a dramatic effect on where it falls on our personal lists. Yeah, and I think you already said where it falls in your list, right? You said like low 90s. Yeah, okay. Well, in that case, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of The Discussion. We finally have two cameras. And for our next film, we will be watching Charlie Chaplin's oh-so-famous City Lights. Nailed it. And after City Lights, we'll be doing Train to Busan? W yeah, wait, what? Which one? Roma. Roma. <laughs> we will be doing Roma. Like and subscribe if you have not already. You can follow Noah here on Instagram. You can follow me at all these links. And have a good one, y'all. Bye.